also had what was called his surgical. River King grows here naturally in Florida. It's very fine. Well, I think it's very long. Yeah. Well, it's hundred. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Chris, and also Bob for inviting me. Uh, I'm really excited to be here, and I appreciate your attendance when I understand there's some other games in town uh, this evening. So thank you for being here. Um, let me give you a, a caveat before I begin, and that is I'm not a Southeast Asian specialist. Um, I've been working there for a couple of years. We've had a few setbacks that I'll mention in my um, talk tonight in terms of our research there. And so my results that I'll be discussing this evening are, are quite preliminary, but nonetheless, I hope you'll find something of interest. A little bit of geographic uh, context. We're currently doing work in uh, central Thailand here in mainland Southeast Asia, surrounded by uh, Myanmar to the northwest, Cambodia to the southeast, uh, and Laos to the northeast. And these are all important uh, regionally in the time periods that I'm, I'm interested in. And in fact, one of the things that um, we'll see is that the, the trade networks that are, that are in place during the Iron Age are quite extensive and, and spanned much further abroad, including all the way over to India. That's, that won't be the focus of my talk. That's a little bit outside of my, my area. I'm a bone guy. So uh, nonetheless, I hope you'll find something of interest here. Now, most of the research on the Iron Age in Thailand has actually been centered on the Karat Plateau. Just to give you a little bit of orientation, here's Bangkok. The Karat Plateau is this uh, high, high plateau up to the northeast of, er, in the northeast of Thailand. We also have a few Iron Age sites that can serve as comparisons in northern Thailand, but we're working roughly about two, two and a half hours north by northeast of Bangkok in a province called Lopburi. This unfortunately is not the site I'm working on. Uh, Lopburi is mostly known for some ruins in town, uh, such, including this one, this is 13th century. It has influence from the Khmer cultures uh, that are headquartered in Cambodia. Lotbury is also well known for uh, a royal palace of King Narai that was present in Lotbury in the uh, Ayutthaya period in the 17th century. But if you mention Lotbury to someone who's from Thailand or spent a significant amount of, Thailand, uh, time, of time in Thailand, you will uh, often hear them mention King Narai's palace or Prong Sang Yat or monkeys. Uh, Lotbury is known for it being overrun by macaques, essentially. And the local population is Buddhist. They won't do anything to harm the monkeys. And they overrun the uh, temples. This is another part of, it's actually a 17th century addition to the prior temple that you saw. Um, and they overrun the, the temple and the town itself. So if you're walking around with groceries in town, you have to be very careful that you don't get mugged by some of your distant relatives. The reason that we are working in Lotbury province is the presence of an Iron Age site in a small village. It's in Lotbury province, and it's about 30 minutes away from the town, the city of Lotbury. And this is a small town of Prompton Thai. There can't be more than a, maybe um, a few hundred households uh, at best in Prompton Thai. The grounds that you see here are, um, this is an unfinished, it's a work in progress, a Buddhist temple on the uh, site grounds. And the surrounding land is, is all rice agriculture, rice cultivation. And the reason that Prompton Thai exists uh, as a small village is because it's maybe a meter or two above the surrounding rice paddies. And so it's slight high ground 
that gives people some protection from floods and allows them to practice rice cultivation in the surrounding fields. This, of course, was the same in, the, um, in prehistoric time periods. And so we actually see a long occupation at Prompton Tai. And we know of the site because individuals living in the village are doing construction on their houses and they're occasionally pulling up Iron Age artifacts as well as much later um, remains from the historic period. So a very brief and uh, basic chronology for the late prehistoric and early historic uh, period, periods in Thailand. I'm going to start um, with the Bronze Age, roughly about 1500 uh, BC. And this is a time period in which we see a little bit um, more intensification of rice agriculture compared to the preceding Neolithic. But we still have individuals that are primarily living in small uh, hamlets. We don't, have, uh, uh, we don't have very high settlement density and, or uh, population size for that matter. And we don't see much evidence for social stratification during the Bronze Age quite yet. During the Iron Age, we start to see intensification both in, in the cultivation of rice, we also see increasing settlement size, increasing population density, increasing existence of long distance trade, possible conflict, at least the rise of iron provides the ample opportunity pr to produce socketed um, spear points. And the Iron Age kicks off about 500 BC in Thailand and is succeeded by the historic period, the Tauravadi period in AD 500. Personally, this is about when my interests cease because this is when Buddhism uh, sweeps into Thailand and not that I don't find Buddhism fascinating, but as a bone guy, as I mentioned earlier, this is when cremation begins in Thailand. And so if I'm interested in finding materials to work with, I have to go back into prehistory, which as you'll see is a little bit hard since I have to go through seven feet of the historic period to get to the Iron Age. So we have the Torvati period beginning in AD 500, increased trade and influence from India as Buddhism sweeps into uh, Thailand at this time period. And then we have some succeeding periods, the Sukhothai period and Ayutthaya period um, beginning in 1238 and 1350 respectively. At Thai, we have very little uh, evidence, but there is some of the late Bronze Age we have occupation during the Iron Age, and this is the cemetery that I'm going to be uh, talking about my results from. And then we also have, again, these historic periods uh, all the way up into at least the 13th century on the site of this current Buddhist, Buddhist temple. So again, the Iron Age, increased reliance on rice and settlement size density, long distance exchange, and the rise of social inequality as indicated at least through differential burial, good, um, burial goods found in interments. This came about, uh, as I mentioned, I'm not a Southeast Asian specialist, but a few years back the, the site was being excavated by Dr. Uh, Tani Lurchernit at Silpacorn University in Bangkok. He is a ceramicist and he started conversations with uh, a colleague and a good friend of mine, uh, Dr. Troy Case, who's an associate professor at North Carolina State. Troy and I uh, have known each other for 18 years back to when we started grad school together. And he called me one day and said, we're gonna start a field school in Southeast Asia, in, in Thailand, and I'd, I'd like you to help out. And I thought, that sounds like a pretty good way to spend the summer. So we began our uh, field school, primarily working at the beginning with burials that had already been exposed. Thailand and much of Southeast Asia doesn't have the degree of political sensitivity that exists in North America and many other places around the world in terms of working with human remains. The prehistoric sites there, what they prefer is that you excavate the sites, you expose the burials, and you leave them in place for tourism. Um, and so it's really quite a different attitude than we're used to um, here in many areas of, of North America. So prior to our joining the project, they had already exposed uh, 
approximately 34 different uh, burials in several excavation units. Very, um, in the year preceding our involvement in the project, some of those had been taken out, but others remained in place. So our first field season, we showed up and our primary job was to not only try to remove uh, additional human remains, but also to begin to process the 24 odd burials that had been removed by prior excavators. <coughs> to give you an idea, um, again, I'm at Eckerd College here in the southern part of uh, Pinellas County, and I usually bring about five of my undergraduate students. Troy Case brings about 15 undergrad and graduate students from uh, North Carolina State, and then we hire a handful, usually about four or five local graduate students who are specialists in historic, uh, primarily historical archaeology, although some um, have experience in prehistory, Thai prehistory as well. And so we have an overall crew size of roughly, roughly 25, uh, maybe 30 per year. The monks on the grounds, that temple I showed you Previously, by the way, the unfinished temple is just out of the right side of the screen, and they have been uh, an immeasurable help with our research in Thailand, helping set up um, some, some canopies to shield uh, us from the sun and the, the rain. We do get a fair bit of rain in the summer in uh, Thailand. It's quite humid. This allows us to not, we don't have to call uh, excavation off on rainy days. We can continue to work as I prefer it and it also gives us some room for the field lab. We also, I feel almost embarrassed to say in front of other people who have archeological experience, we have the best lunches you've ever had in the field. Um, this is uh, next to that temple I showed you a minute ago, but the real genius behind this is San. You would not know it from his skills in the kitchen, but he's actually a, just finished his master's in historical archeology. span And the first year we were planning on hiring a local um, a local villager from Prompton Thai and Tani said, I actually have a grad student who says he can cook for us. Do you want to try it? And I thought, why not? And the best Thai food I've ever had every day. He doesn't repeat a meal until the end of the project and then he asks us what our favorite is. And I have to really try very hard to convince students that you will never see this again in your career. Uh, this, this kind of, you know, this is not archeology span at most projects. Um, just to give you a sense, he's carved this pepper in the shape of a flower. It's, it's ridiculous. Um, I, uh. Now, we've had a few set setbacks I mentioned. In 2010, uh, our first field season was in 2009. In 2010, we had to cancel quite late, bef right before uh, our departure due to political unrest in Thailand. And uh, the universities uh, were not interest interested in us taking uh, students to Thailand at that point. And then later in 2010, there were some massive floods. And I, um, I saw the news and I saw people paddling their boats down main streets in Lotbury. And I said, we're in trouble. And in fact, our unit, which again had been excavated down to about eight feet below uh, the surface to get to the Iron Age burials, it's a six by six meter unit, collapsed, filled with water and collapsed. All the burials that had been exposed were now no, really no longer accessible. So this means that my last season there, we had to start from scratch. Um, we opened up a new unit nearby and began work on the historic period levels. We've made quite some progress, um, despite the fact that, again, this is not sterile uh, soil that we're working through. It's the historic period, and so it's quite time consuming. And then, of course, we're just hoping that when we get seven to eight feet down that we actually haven't missed the Iron Age Cemetery after all of that work. These are a couple of our historic period finds from our last uh, field, se field season. We have the um, a ceramic uh, horns from some kind of bull type statuette, spindle whorls. And this was on one of our favorite finds. Uh, I wish I had uh, shown an illustration of what this would look like uh, once it's cleaned up, but uh, this is a silver coin from probably about the sixth century, and it has a conch shell motif on it. For someone who teaches at Eckerd College, it's quite appropriate. That's our, uh, our symbol. Um, but this is a style that we see coming over from India. This is a, an Indian influence that, that comes into um, 
into Thailand during the early historic period. This lets us know that we're getting down near the bottom of the historic period level. But really what I'm here to talk about today are the Iron Age burials. And compared to a few of the other areas that I've worked, they are uh, often quite rich in uh, burial goods, which opens up new avenues for research. And one of the things that we're hoping to get to in future seasons is really do an in-depth mortuary analysis and look for patterns in terms of artifacts with age and sex and other biological factors that might help us understand mortuary behavior during the Iron Age. Here you see that the burials are extended. They're on their back. The bone preservation, surprisingly, at Prumton Thai is quite good for Southeast Asia. It's not an area that you typically think of as having good prone bone preservation, uh, which is why I, I keep going back. And we see that we typically have ceramics that are either near the head or the feet. Polished stone axes, we have a small, a small one between the knees polishing stones, uh, food items. I think they've already been pulled in this uh, picture, but we had some ribs right here next to the uh, cranium, and then some leg bones of uh, a small hoofed animal right here. Marble earrings, shell and jade beads, uh, 15 ivory bracelets, two shell arm bangles. You can see part of one of them here. So really quite rich. Here's a close-up of a few of these items interred in uh, this particular burial anyways, burial 12. Um, we have these green stone um, beads. These are the marble earrings I was referring to a minute ago. A variety of shell beads of varying sizes. Um, I believe over 100 found in and around the neck of this particular burial. This is a close-up of the ivory uh, bracelets. Here's the right forearm. Uh, coming down, the hand would be right down here, and we see these ivory bracelets. They're not, not in very good shape. And one of the small polished stone uh, axes. And then the burial ceramics that you saw a minute ago up near the head. We returned earlier um, in, in July, maybe June, and spent about three and a half weeks in Thailand this summer trying to do some of our preliminary analysis. Interested, of course, in some basic sex and age determination, and then also looking at a variety of health indicators um, that I'll talk about in a minute. So we're looking for uh, differences in cranial robusticity that might help indicate um, male versus female. Also changes in the pelvis that relating, of course, to the anatomical constraints of childbirth that would help us differentiate male and female. And also, of course, a wide variety of age indicators, including fusion of growth plates, overall size, uh, degeneration of the pubic symphysis in the front uh, of the pelvic basin, uh, dental development and eruption. And so here are a couple of the uh, remains. Uh, here we have a medial clavicle. You may know it as your collarbone, and the medial clavicle is the last bone to fuse, the last uh, growth plate to fuse in the, the skeleton. And so this indicates this individual is a young adult. It fuses around 25 to 27 years of age, roughly. Uh, here we have a very square uh, pubic bone, indicating that this is a, a female. And overall, what we found so far is that we have very few subadults very few subadults, and in fact, most of the individuals that we have a good age indicator on are actually young adults between the ages of 18 and 27. And this is a little bit unusual in, uh, again, the lack of subadults and the lack of older uh, adults. And we think this is likely due to a small sample size. Again, there are only about 34 burials that have been exposed. We were able to recover 24 before the flood. And it's very likely as we continue to expand working in the cemetery that we expect this uh, demographic profile to change. Um, we also so far have a pretty even mix of males and females where, where sex can be determined. One of the areas that we studied this summer is in examination for evidence of trauma. And we have three individuals that are affected. 
I really haven't calculated frequencies here because we have some individuals that are well represented by the entire skeleton and others that are represented by uh, very few elements. And so uh, we're still working on, on um, bone counts, et cetera, that will allow us to get some, some better frequencies. But as I said, it's a small sample, so the frequencies are likely to change anyways. Two males and one female. And the elements that are uh, affected include ribs in two different individuals clavicle in, in um, five ribs in two different individuals, that is, one clavicle fracture and one very minor cranial fracture that I'll show you a slide of in, in a minute. Here is the left clavicle, left collarbone, and the superior view and inferior view, and you can see this discontinuity. It's healed, but this discontinuity running rather obliquely in the lateral side of the left clavicle. And, uh, leading to uh, thickening. The clavicle is very frequently fractured, but the clavicle not only articulates medially with the, the manubrium, but also laterally with part of your shoulder blade, the acromion process, and there's also a wide variety of ligaments. So when the clavicle is fractured, it very often is pulled out of position and we end up with slight angulation and deformation at that fracture site. In that same individual, we see two additional ribs that are fractured and they are upper ribs on the same side. We have the left second rib and the left third rib that are fractured. Here you see the, um, the rib uh, tubercle where it articulates here and here with the vertebra. So we're looking at the, the back part of the rib. And here we see this callus or area in which there has been healing of that fracture site. So both, all of these fractures are uh, healed. The other rib fractures in a different individual are from the lower right side. And as you can see, these are small fragments, and even then I had to piece them together. Ribs aren't something that uh, preserve well in many cases. And so we've been able to identify these as a right rib 12, a right rib 11, and this is very likely, here's the fracture site, it's healed. I believe it's very likely to be a, a fragment of the, the 10th rib, just superior to the 11th right ri uh, rib. But what we see here are, again, some healing in these areas. There's an extra patch of healing, much like this one, right here where it fractures, uh, where, the, um, where it's broken post-mortem. And so we, it looks like we have, in this individual, at least four fractures in those three ribs on the lower right side. So this is the basic pattern we have for injuries to the, uh, uh, injuries to the torso. We have the left clavicle the left second rib and third rib, and then these lower right ribs. We'll talk again in a, in a minute about the interpretation uh, of these. And then we have a very minor probable fracture of the left parietal. The left parietal is the left side of the cranial vault. Um, a very minor uh, crease here did not penetrate through the inner table, uh, solely affects the outer table of the cranial vault. So it was un unlikely to cause serious complications for this individual. To put to a bit of context, there has been a variety of work on trauma in Southeast Asian prehistoric contexts. And from the Neolithic to the Bronze Age, again, we do see increasing settlement size, importance of rice, and s the c continuity of little social stratification. And so far, other researchers have established a pattern whereby in the Neolithic, we have a very low prevalence of trauma. And in the samples that have been analyzed, it has tended to focus on the clavicle as well as fractures in both the hands and the feet. Whereas the succeeding Bronze Age, higher prevalence of trauma, actually about 10 times higher than the preceding Neolithic. So it's a bit of a jump. And you can see that we have a wide variety of elements that are affected. The two most prominent being the ulna and the radius, and the ulna and the radius are the bones of your forearm. After that, the fibula, a bone of the lower leg, then the clavicle, the femur, the, your thigh bone, hands, feet, and importantly, the face and mandible. So, Overall, we have this pattern before the Iron Age already of increasing trauma and possible evidence for more conflict. Traditionally, when you look for trauma patterns that are indicative of interpersonal conflict,
the classic signs, not that there aren't problems with interpreting them that way, but the classic signs are generally thought to be forearm fractures that might be uh, so-called perifracture, as you see here in this uh, illustration, individuals who are in hand-to-hand -hand combat, they're defending themselves, and so they end up with perifractures, often a fracture of the ulna, and then depending on the force of the blow, fracture or dislocation of the radius. So this fits the pattern that we see of this increase in forearm fractures in the Bronze Age. And we also tend to associate fractures of the face and cranial vault, particularly on the left side when you're faced with a right-handed attacker, as potentially indicating uh, increase in conflict. What's interesting about the Bronze Age is we don't see much evidence for a buildup in defensive structures at archaeological sites. We don't see a proliferation of, of artifacts that are indicative of uh, weaponry used for interpersonal conflict. And so there's been this suggestion that this interpersonal conflict may actually be within the communities and not necessarily between communities. But this is something that obviously needs a little bit more exploration. There are some comparative sites for Prom Ten Tai, PTT, and one of the most well-known is Ban Chang. This is a, a well-known Iron Age site in, up on the Karat Plateau, as I, as I mentioned, where most of the archaeological work in the Iron Age has centered. And at Ban Chang, they have a much larger sample than we do uh, so far. They have ribs as the most common fracture, not the forearm. Spondylolysis is a mouthful, but this is a fracture of the lower back that's typically involved, uh, at least today, in individuals who are doing very strainful uh, lifting or awkward um, labor with the, with the back, taking the brunt of the load. Some fractures of the skull, the hands, and some possible clavicle fractures, which aside from being a common fracture when you may fall, and the blow may fall on your uh, shoulder and, and fracture the clavicle, it's also a common fracture in, especially in non-industrial contexts, relating to childbirth and uh, difficult delivery can result in clavicular fractures. And because these are both sub-adults, the uh, authors have suggested that this actually could be birth trauma um, that accounts for these possible clavicle fractures in these individuals. But overall, the research on the Iron Age in Thailand, in terms of trauma patterns at least, is really not one that's indicative of interpersonal conflict, even though this is the time period in which we see evidence of moats or possible defensive structures around these larger settlements. We see the ramping up of iron weaponry. But yet, in the, in the skeletal record, we really haven't seen much uh, evidence of this interpersonal conflict at the sites that have been studied to date. So the conclusion instead is that these are individuals that, that live a, a life of heavy physical labor. Um, they're out working in their fields. They have large domesticated animals that uh, occasionally may uh, run over them or step on their feet, uh, pin them and break, break ribs, uh, et cetera, but not an overall pattern suggestive of, of violence. And that's, that's exactly what we've concluded so far in this small sample at PTT. That is, clavicle and rib fractures are, are fairly common as, accidental, as a result of an accidental fall. And the lack of real facial or forearm fractures uh, doesn't really lead us to conclude that there's much evidence for interpersonal conflict at Prompton Thai. So, so far the pattern for Central Thailand seems to be matching what we see up on the Karat Plateau. Cribra orbitalia, here to give you a sense of what we're looking at, we are looking up into the left uh, eye orbit of a child, one of the few subadults that we have at PTT. And cribra orbitalia, orbitalia stems from the orbits. And cribra refers to the cribriform appearance or this pockmarked um, appearance within this eye orbit. Cribra orbitalia is quite common in sites around the world. For example, the uh, Western Hemisphere Project has looked at thousands of skeletons, had compiled, compiled uh, research by a large number of researchers all over the Americas, North and South America, and they found that roughly 20% of individuals that have been excavated at these sites in North and South America have evidence of cribra orbitalia. At Ban Chiang, on the Karat Plateau during the Iron Age, 
the rate is 40 percent. Very, very high rate. Traditionally, this has always been, and by always I mean probably since the 50s, this has been interpreted as evidence of iron deficiency anemia. In some recent work by Phil Walker and uh, colleagues, they have reinterpreted this because it doesn't really match, it doesn't correlate all that strongly with other evidence that we thought was indicative of iron deficiency anemia, such as parotic hyperostosis. So this recent work has suggested that that Cribra orbitalia may actually represent a different form of anemia, megaloblastic anemia, in which the problem is the proliferation of large and immature um, red blood cells and not actually um, hypertrophy of the marrow that would occur in iron deficiency anemia and that this is largely related to hypovitaminosis B12, uh, a deficiency of vitamin B12. So this is, this is very difficult to parse out, of course, because often when individuals have one f nutritional deficiency, they're very likely to have other nutritional defi deficiencies. And so pinpointing the exact uh, causative factor can be quite uh, challenging. Nonetheless, if uh, Walker and colleagues are, are correct about this recent reinterpretation of the meaning of Cribra orbitalia, then the symptoms that affected individuals might be expected to in, uh, display would include gastrointestinal problems and neurological complications, possibly leading to psychosis. Uh, in some individuals. And so this can be quite a, quite a serious condition. We don't have any other evidence so far at PTT of other um, individuals with Cribra orbitalia. We do have some very mild healed parotic hyperostosis. May indicate iron deficiency anemia, but we're still, we're still working on that. As a graduate of uh, Arizona State University in my graduate work, of course, I, have to, I had to learn to, to look at teeth under uh, Christy Turner. Um, and so we've been looking at uh, oral pathology and dental pathology. Here you see uh, a clear demonstration of why it's important for regular checkups uh, at your dentist. This is dental calculus. This is mineralized plaque. So we have evidence of quite a substantial calculus deposits in some individuals. Here we see what many would call an abscess, but there's actually no evidence of drainage uh, as of yet. And so some would object to that terminology and uh, call it an, an alveolar defect of pulpal origin, uh, is what some may refer to it as. It's a mouthful. And also evidence of periodontal disease, although frankly, the, the teeth at, at PTT are, are fantastic. I've looked at teeth from uh, many, many different areas, uh, many different time periods, and PTT has some of the best teeth that I've ever seen. But nonetheless, we do see some of this guttering here and rounding of the alveolar bone and retraction of that bone from the uh, tooth itself. And this is suggestive of, of uh, periodontal disease. One of the easiest things, or at least most frequently studied, when it comes to dental pathology is the calculation of caries frequencies. You may know them as cavities. And these, of course, uh, are indicative. These are uh, areas of the destruction of dental hard tissues due to bacterial infection. And not surprisingly, this is closely tied to diet and, of course, hygienic practices that may vary both between cultures and also between individuals. In the late 1970s, uh, Christy Turner did some very interesting research looking at samples from around the world and looking at caries frequencies along with um, the subsistence patterns practiced at those sites. And he classified them, he mixed them down into uh, hunter-gatherer societies, mixed economies, and then more full agriculturalists. And he calculated in these, this really large, fairly global sample the mean caries rates and also the, the caries rates between samples. And so in hunter-gatherers, 0 to 5.3 percent with an average of 1.3 percent of teeth exhibiting carious lesions, very, very low. Mixed economies, we see uh, a range from 0.4 to 10 percent with a mean just under 5. 
And then it's really with agriculturalists where we start to see this dramatic decline in oral health. This often surprises many people. Um, but we see uh, a great proliferation of, uh, of caries. And of course, this is exacerbated in modern times where we also have Twinkies and, and uh, soft drinks and, all, and a number of other things. <laughs> but uh, nonetheless, this is a general trend that we see. So we know that during the Iron Age, we have evidence of this intensification of rice agriculture. So one of the basic things that we can do with the several hundred teeth that we have at PTT is calculate the frequency and it's less than 1%. The tooth I uh, have been showing here to the right is the only permanent tooth I have at PTT with a cavity. Uh, and that's out of about 200 uh, permanent teeth. And so, as I said, the, the teeth are, are beautiful um, to me. And it, this is, in fact, the pattern that we see in Southeast Asia and a number of other people who are doing bioarchaeological research in Southeast Asia have uh, certainly established this uh, well before our uh, research. And they all tend to find the exact same thing. In fact, a few have suggested that oral health increases in quality as we uh, enter the agricultural, uh, agricultural economies of the Bronze Iron Age and later periods. One of the suggestions uh, or explanations that's been offered for these rates, which do not match what we see in most other areas of the world. In North America, we see um, a dramatic increase in caries frequencies associated particularly with uh, maize agriculture and other um, potential uh, domesticates in Europe and elsewhere. And so, so far, the pattern in Southeast Asia is that this doesn't seem to occur. And that this may be because rice is not as karyogenic, that is, as uh, conducive to um, the formation of caries as we see in other early domesticates. I'd like to tell you something that was one of the most interesting things uh, to me that I found, although I'm afraid it may be one of the most boring things I mentioned to you tonight. Um, much of my work can best be described as skeletal biology. I, I do bioarchaeology, but I'm also very interested in modern human variation um, and ancient human variation in the skeleton and dentition. And I've been working for about 13 years on a fairly obscure, um, certainly in anthropological circles, an obscure congenital anomaly of the hands and feet. Anthropologists never talk about this. Um, it's all in the medical literature. And Troy Case and I have spent about 13, 14 years um, looking, trying to bring what we're learning from the medical literature, bring it into the skeletal, uh, our skeletal analyses, um, both of modern and ancient peoples, and try to understand uh, what's going on. And so uh, I'd like to explain why I found this particular bone, which looks very boring to, to most, even most osteologists, frankly, uh, why I found it of interest. Tarsal coalition, tarsal, uh, tarsals are the bones of your feet, but we can also have this uh, occur in the wrist, the carpals, the bones of the, of the wrist. It is a mouse segmentation defect that occurs during the embryonic period. And that is roughly about the fifth week of embryonic development. Your um, foot, in this case, is formed of this mesenchyme, and the body actually um, determines where those joints are going to be. So it basically chops up that mesenchyme into what forms the tarsals later on uh, and other parts of the foot. In some individuals, that process does not occur in, uh, normally. And so we end up with carpal or tarsals in this case, excuse me, that end up united as one. And they can be united in bone, that is uh, two bones that look like they've fused together, but fusion's not the way to think about it, it's a mal segmentation, they've never separated. And so this can be osseous if they're, boned, if they're joined by bone, or non-osseous in this case. This very small lesion here on the side of this very small uh, foot bone uh, indicates to me we have this little round lesion here, it's pitted, and this tells me that there was actually a non-osseous coalition where this was joined to a neighboring bone by cartilage or fibrocartilage. Sometimes this can be symptomatic, it can cause pain. Most people who have these are probably not aware of it, um, but they can be symptomatic. And it is heritable. So in recent, uh, in fact, someone just took our research um, 
in 2011 and uh, published a paper looking at Upper Paleolithic burials from Italy and arguing that two individuals from a cave site, um, I believe the dates were about 20,000 years old, and two of these three individuals interred in this cave both share a rare coalition. And so they're arguing that these individuals are related, which is uh, pretty good given the probability of that uh, occurring otherwise. But generally, if you look in the medical literature, they're very clear for the last 100 years, they say this doesn't vary between populations. And um, that is until Troy and I started looking at it. Um, and this is basically what I figured out over the, over the past 13 years, Troy and I uh, together. We have um, coalitions can occur uh, up in the toes as well. And so this is actually from a paper I, I just published in 2010. Troy and I published our big uh, paper on tarsal coalition arguing that individuals of African ancestry or European ancestry have these different patterns, but it's primarily in the, the midfoot uh, that these populations are different. We published that in 2010. I had a colleague at the Smithsonian who had this rare form of coalition that she came across doing some of the NAGPRA inventories at the Smithsonian in a Native American uh, sample. And this was really rare. Um, and I started doing the medical, the, uh, the literature review, trying to find any case that's ever been published on it in any language at any time. And what I found was that I kept on finding cases in in um, Native American skeletal reports uh, on Native American sites. And I thought, wow, you know, wouldn't it be great to understand what kind of pattern there is? So this is based mostly on case reports, not on population surveys. So this, is a, this data is a little bit weaker. But I began to become curious about, I wonder if I could find any medical literature coming out of Asia that might help me understand this pattern. So I started digging into Japanese literature. Some of it was 100 years old and published in German. Uh, I have reports coming out of Korean uh, medical journals. And what I basically found is that uh, Native Americans show the same pattern that we see in Asians, which is very interesting because it implies that this is very likely a pattern that dates back to the late Pleistocene. Um, as many of you know, there's quite a bit of debate uh, over the peopling of the new world. I'm certainly not here to weigh in on that debate. Um, but people's, uh, people who do have a vested interest in that debate are largely uh, in consensus that, uh, of course, Native Americans are descended from uh, populations in Asia, not surprisingly. And so I also became uh, curious to whether we can find any archaeological cases of tarsal coalition. I have this modern medical reports coming out of Korea and Japan. I wonder if we can find any. And I, uh, Google was my friend, and I found a, a dissertation that somebody did working on an early to mid-Holocene site in the Lake Baikal region of, uh, of Asia. And she actually had gone to school with uh, one of my grad school classmates, and so she actually knew what tarsal coalition was. And she found some very rare uh, cases, particularly in the proximal midfoot. And so we made the prediction that, all right, we know it's occurring in Asia. We know it's occurring in Asian-derived peoples of the New World. And we also know that it has some antiquity in Asia. So if we find more cases, then I would predict that they will continue to show these rare midfoot coalitions if we're lucky enough to find them. And that's exactly what we found at PTT. This was very gratifying, of course, because I was working on that paper while I was working at PTT. And we found this, and there were only two known cases that we had uh, managed to find at that time, neither of which was archaeological. And so here we have a case that's um, about 2,500 years old or so. Personally, very gratifying when you're right. Some of our future uh, research and continued uh, projects that we'd like to do one, again, as someone who uh, likes teeth, I, I'd like to continue to look at uh, the dentition, among other things, look at dental morphology using the ASU Dental Anthropology System, which is a system of dental plaques that describe different dental variants from uh, incisors, canines, premolars, and molars throughout the dentition. And we, we uh, dental researchers uh, worldwide frequently use this so that we can compare our results. Not surprisingly, we have shovel-shaped incisors uh, in uh, Iron Age Thailand. We have uh, three-rooted mandibular uh, molars, which aren't that common in many populations, but in, um, in modern Thailand are up to 20%. And that obviously is the case in antiquity as well, some, some higher frequencies. So we would like to look at dental morphology, 
look at linear enamel hypoplasia. These are, here we're looking at uh, the, the left dental arcade of the, of the mandible, the lower jaw, and we have the uh, molars, premolars, left mandibular canine, and a lateral incisor. And you can see these bands across the left mandibular canine. These are indicative of systemic stress. Systemic stress when this tooth was being formed young in this individual's life, it very likely erupted around 11 years of age. And so the crown was forming much earlier. And the enamel is deposited in layers. So if that individual suffers, say, from some kind of systemic stressor like infection or malnutrition, then that enamel that's being formed is often deficient. And so we see this band as they heal and it resumes forming stronger enamel again. And then they um, are sick again or malnourished, et cetera. And so we see these series of bands. And so one of the things that we're currently doing is we can actually measure where this occurs on the tooth crown and get an, uh, an idea of the actual ages this individual suffered systemic stress. And then we can compare the site and, try and across the region and see if we see patterns. Also like to study anti-mortem chipping, that is chipping that occurs during life that's indicative of strong stress to the dentition. In some cases, it can help indicate behavioral or um, occupational tasks that are being done with the dentition. And in this individual in particular, it's a little hard to see here, but there's some green staining uh, in the enamel of these individuals. We have a handful of individuals that exhibit this green staining on the tooth enamel, while many others do not. And I'm, I believe that this is very likely to be copper staining. And I'm hoping to have somebody look into that uh, quite shortly. That's our uh, future uh, and continued work. I'd like to thank my uh, colleagues at Sil Silpacorn University, North Carolina State, and Eckerd. Um, the bioarchaeologists who worked at PTT uh, prior to my involvement with the uh, project, the Fine Arts Department and National Research Council of Thailand for giving us permission for our research, and of course the people of Promptin Thai who have been very supportive of our work. Thank you very much. Any questions? Uh, one of the interesting things about the Bronze Age, Bronze Age site, one of the most important uh, quarries appears to be not far from Prompton Thai for early metallurgy um, in uh, central Thailand. Um, and so there appears to be a fair bit of activity during the Bronze Age in this region, even though we have uh, very little of it at uh, Prompton Thai specifically. Well, a number of things. Uh, that, that's a good observation. Um, we don't seem to have the root stumps that are so prolific at a lot of uh, sites here in North America. Um, one factor to, to recall is we think we have a biased sample so far. And so again, most of the individuals that we have are young adults, 18 to 27, a handful that are younger, um, and then uh, very few that are older. So part of this may be a sampling issue. Part of this might be a, a sampling issue. Um, there's, of course, also the possibility in uh, differences in rice preparation in terms of how they're preparing the rice, the, the degree of time they're uh, boiling it, for example, um, and the consistency of that early rice. And, and I'm not really sure about that, but there may be some, some changes in the consistency of the diet that uh, also may play a role. Um, these we're excavating right now on the grounds of the uh, temple. I, um, just next to our excavation unit, um, to the uh, east, are, uh, there's a, a fence uh, that surrounds a, some 13th century structures. Um, I don't know if they had found materials uh, during um, that excavation to put in that fence. Um, the, the reason that we knew about the site, as I mentioned earlier, is the, the local villagers. There were actually a couple looters from the local village who were... Um, excavating parts of the site um, until one of them came down with a fairly rare condition, I'm not quite sure what, and now they're, they really believe that, um, that this is because they were looting, that there's this supernatural, they're, they're uh, paying the piper now, uh, so to speak. So in terms of um, why uh, Tani chose this area next to, the, to uh, the temple on this part of the temple grounds, I'm not really quite sure. Uh, I don't know of any subsurface uh, you know, prospecting that he's done to, uh, to look in that area. 
Um, by the time we were involved, they had already been excavating in that area. We don't, but this is hundreds of meters away from the main part of the village. So it appears to be uh, quite a large site. Uh, I don't know that all of it will be cemetery, very unlikely. Um, but so far in, for example, in a, again, that original six by six meter unit, they had uh, about 34 burials. Um, you just have to get through the historic period to get to them. Uh, so really quite dense. A lot of the things I would like to do in the future, uh, I'm hoping to get a student who can uh, maybe do a master's project or, uh, or a, an undergraduate senior thesis. We did this summer um, in our initial inventory and analysis, notice some differential muscle development um, between the right and left side. And so we suspect that um, it might be a fruitful area for future research and I hope to do it. Uh, I don't know if it'll be next year, but, but hopefully before too long. That's a, that's a good question. <laughs> that's a good question, especially if some other places like Banxiang are having, uh, you know, 40% uh, of individuals with cribriform uh, or cribra orbitalia. It'll be very interesting um, to see what happens with that. It, the, um, the paper uh, su su suggesting B12 uh, vitamin deficiency is, is really relatively quite recent and and um, it can actually be masked by things like an excessive folic acid. And so it's really quite complicated to parse these different nutritional diseases and, and hypovitaminoses out. Um, in fact, this is something that, that people are talking about here in, in uh, the US because we supplement our diet with folic acid. Folic acid supplementation is um, one of the most effective way to avoid birth defects like spina bifida. And so they actually suspect that we actually have a higher prevalence of B12 issues here in the US, but that's being masked by this supplementation of folic acid. So it'll be really interesting to see how this debate plays out in the public health sphere and, and also as we begin to apply it to remains in the past. I'm not really sure what accounts for it. I mean, t traditionally when you think of areas, uh, soil types in high rainfall, uh, tropical areas, you think of typically quite acidic uh, soils. Bone preservation is uh, you know, really not what you, th good bone preservation is really not what you think of. Um, and I was pleasantly surprised when I was out there. Again, I consider myself, even though it's been several years, fairly new to Southeast Asia in terms of research. Um, but other, um, you notice here my acknowledgments, uh, Nancy Tails and uh, Sean Halcrow, they're, they're doing a lot of work in uh, Southeast Asia. They're the primary bioarchaeologists that have been working in Thailand um, and to a lesser extent in uh, Cambodia. Um, and they commented on the very same thing. They said the, this bone preservation tends to, appears to be some of the best that we've seen in Iron Age sites in Thailand. And so I'm quite happy that I landed there and not, not elsewhere. Harris lines? Yeah. Yeah, Harris lines are what we would call the, uh, you're talking about the, yeah, um, the, yeah. Yeah, the linear enamel hyperplasia. Similar etiology. Harris lines are what we would refer to in the bones themselves. So okay. you can see, you uh, can see similar structures affecting, for example, long bone growth due to systemic stress that are apparent on, uh, on radiographic or, or x ray examination. So the, the good thing about the dental tissues is one, enamel is the hardest tissue in the body, but also it doesn't remodel. And so once that enamel is laid down, it's a permanent record of, um, and until it wears away or is decayed, et cetera. And so this, this is what makes the dental tissue so, so valuable. Um, any other questions? All right, thank you.